A Walk Through the Waters, a serialized historical Christian romance. Sonnets of the Spice Isle, Book 4. Written by Lynette Bonner. Narrated by Mary Sarah Agliotta. Part 1. Isaiah 43, 2. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And through the rivers, they shall not overflow you. When you walk through the fire, you shall not be burned, nor shall the flame scorch you. Chief Banda's village, Lake Nyasa, at the dawning of a new day. The sun was just cresting above the horizon when Ryan woke and stepped onto the sand outside her and Papa's hut. The breeze off the lake cut through her blouse and breeches in a way that reminded her she could probably resume wearing proper women's attire now that they'd arrived at the village. And yet, after wearing the men's clothing for the past several weeks, she'd found them to be quite freeing, certainly much less restrictive. Perhaps she would grant herself a few more days' reprieve from corsets and hoops. She folded her arms against the chill and enjoyed the orange and pink hues of dawn spreading across the dome of the sky. Trent and his men were already gone. Even though she'd known they would be, she felt as though another weight had just dropped onto her shoulders. It was nonsense for her to miss him. The man had made it perfectly clear on numerous occasions that nothing could grow between them. And if she wanted to be fair to him, and she did, she wouldn't pursue a relationship with him, for to do so would require her to be honest with him about her heritage, and if word ever got out about her ancestry, it would be the death now to mother's social standing and to the captain's business workings on Zanzibar. Not that she feared the captain would say anything to anyone, but still, right at this moment there were exactly four other people in the world who knew that Anne Hunter was not Ryan's real mother, and those were the immediate members of her family. The more people who knew, the more likely the news would somehow leak to the public. She had to be mindful of that and consider carefully before she said anything to the captain. She wrinkled her nose. She simply wouldn't think of him. Instead, she wrapped her arms about herself and forced her concentration to the clean scent of the morning breeze wafting off the lake. The birds had already been warbling for the past half hour, and it appeared by the bustle of activity she could observe from all the huts around theirs, that the villagers were not far behind. Papa's breaths had rattled in his throat the whole night long, but he seemed alert and excited when she went back in to check on him. Would you like some porridge, Papa? She offered him a hand and lifted him into a sitting position. I think tea will suffice this morning. Thank you, daughter. She didn't like to see him skipping a meal, but had learned over the past few weeks that if she left him to his own choices, he would eat eventually. She placed his Bible next to him on the cot and set about to quietly prepare his tea. When she brought it to him, he said, See if you can't find Keiko, would you, dear? I want him to arrange a meeting with the chief for me. I'd like to put up a shelter of sorts for chapel services. Part of it can be used as a clinic also. Shouldn't a clinic and a church be separate? She helped him draw on a clean shirt and handed him his boots. He smiled. I think the good Lord will forgive us for being frugal with our construction for the time being. That was probably true enough. After breakfast, she left Papa seated on a rock near the fire pit outside their door and made her way through the chatter of a village just coming to life to see if she could find Keiko. Two women, walking toward the lake with clay pots, giggled with each other and altered their course when they took note of her. Both women stepped right into her personal space, and one was even bold enough to reach out and finger the linen of her shirt. The other, apparently emboldened, when Ryan, in her shock, could come up with no appropriate negative response to the first, reached out to touch Ryan's hair. She gave a vocalization of awe that drew her companion's hands to Ryan's hair also. Ryan grimaced, but bore the relatively intimate inspection with as much grace as she could muster. She felt rather like a baby baboon, being groomed by a troop of boisterous mother baboons. But she realized that their behavior was born of simple curiosity, and let them finger a curl for a moment longer.
before offering them each a smile and taking a purposeful step back. One woman seemed reluctant to release Ryan's hair, and Ryan had to somewhat forcefully extract the curl from between the woman's fingers. Next time, she made note, she would pin her hair all the way up. But this time she pasted on a smile. My name is Ryan. She laid a hand on her chest. And you are? She waited, bouncing a glance between the two women, but they only looked blankly at each other and then back to her. They apparently did not understand the Kiswahili that she spoke fluently, and Ryan felt her hopes deflate a little more. It was one more weight that pressed on her. If Papa passed away, she didn't even know enough of the language to communicate, much less get herself back to the coast. Why had the captain had to rush off the moment they'd arrived? She bade the women farewell and found Keiko down near the shore and led him back to Papa. Papa explained what he wanted and was quite pleased when Keiko assured him there was no need to talk to the chief, but the man had already indicated Keiko should give them every possible concession. Papa was even further pleased when Keiko had a crew of the village's men working to erect a small shelter near the beach by that very afternoon. The walls were not more than strips of bamboo split the long way and then woven together to form a matting of sorts. But the roof was thickly thatched and sturdy, and the bamboo weave would allow breeze to flow through to cool the building's occupants. Even before the last wall had been tied into place, Papa insisted on being helped into the building. There were tears shimmering in his eyes when he stood at the front and turned to face the room. Ryan swallowed, once again thankful that she'd given her all to help her father fulfill his calling. She was blessed to have a man such as this one for her Papa. The next day and for a week afterward, Papa's energy seemed to be in peak form. Each day a couple hours before noon, he would ring a gong he'd fashioned from an old piece of iron tied to a string outside the shelter. And as many as were free and wanted to come hear him speak, made their way to the chapel clinic near the beach. After Papa read from the Bible, he would, with Keiko translating, answer any questions the people had. And then he and Ryan would doctor any wounded who would accept their help. Mostly, they only bandaged small cuts and abrasions, for any serious illness was considered too important for the white Azungo to handle. For those sicknesses, the people went to the village doctor, who was more likely to cast a spell over them than heal them. The man, with his large ivory nose ring and body piercings shot through with porcupine quills, made a chill run down Ryan's spine each time she saw him. Each day fewer and fewer villagers came to hear Papa speak, and finally Keiko informed Papa that the village doctor had made it clear it would displease him greatly if the people continued to listen to the white man's lies about a non-existent god. But though Ryan was tempted to despair, Papa refused to give up hope. He reminded her to put her trust in the god who had brought them here. And then one day, just when Papa was saying the closing prayer over the chapel hour, two men had been brave enough to ignore the medicine man's instructions. There rose a great commotion outside. Miss Ryan, Miss Ryan! That was June's voice rising above all the hubbub. Ryan rushed out to see whatever the matter could be. June motioned madly for her to come. It is the wife of Chief Wonkulu. The babe faces the wrong way, and the village doctor says to leave her alone, and that they will both die. Ryan's eyes widened. On their trip here, they had taken rest in a village just a day's journey back along the trail. The chief of that village had misused his people terribly, including his wife, who had been full with child. Ryan rushed back into the chapel. Papa, we are needed right now. She snatched up his doctor bag and reached for his arm to help him rise. But he was so slow to gain his feet, she changed her mind about her approach. Keiko, you bring him down, would you? I'm running ahead to see what I can find out. As she rushed out the door, one thought pounded over and over. If that baby died in this village, not only would the people's belief in their sham of a doctor be shored up, but a war would begin of a certainty. Honkulu would not let an offense like that stand, especially not after the way Trent had allowed the man's abused wife to accompany them to this village. Honkulu had already been livid over that. 
The woman's hut was far back in the concentric circles of the village. Outside it, a crowd of women already keened the way they might over a corpse. Ryan pushed through them and into an interior so dark and smoky that her lantern did little except to illuminate wafts of churning grey clouds. Finally, she was able to locate the moaning woman who squatted against the wall near the door. She met June's wide, terrified gaze. Remind me of her name? Yanni. Okay. We're going to need to be able to see. We need to move her outside. Lay a blanket in the shade of the banana tree, and we'll move her there. And... She motioned through the door toward the crowd of wailing women. That keening must stop. She's not dead. While well, June made those preparations and remonstrated the crowd to silence, Ryan laid a hand to Yoni's forehead. She was warm, but not overly so, probably only from her exertion. A contraction must have gripped the woman, for she suddenly gave out a gritty moan and clutched at a womb in anguish. There now, Yoni, Ryan soothed, rubbing the woman's shoulder. My father is a doctor. Likely Yoni couldn't understand her any better than the two women along the path the other day, but Ryan hoped her tone at least conveyed a reassuring message. All will be well. We are going to help you or at least give it their best attempt. She set to rolling up her sleeves while she waited for the preparations outside to be completed. June returned and indicated that the blanket was ready, and they helped the agonized woman out to it. But Yanni refused to lie down and instead squatted in the middle of the blanket. Ryan was thankful to see that at least the woman's waters had not broken open yet. Now that she could see better how to help, Ryan realized she was trembling all over. If Papa couldn't save this baby, and maybe its mother. She swallowed and pushed the thought aside for the moment. Just then, Papa shuffled up, holding on to Keiko's arm. Ryan blew out a breath of relief. If anyone could make this better, Papa could. But instead of pitching in to help, he motioned to a log round by a nearby fire pit, and Keiko fetched it for him. Papa sank onto it, panting. Movement just behind Papa drew Ryan's attention. The village doctor. His face smeared white with a mixture of ash, glowered so angrily Ryan felt the look, like she would have felt the thrust of the long, feather-decorated spear he held in one hand. Papa? Ryan's tremors had ratcheted up to full force. Calm yourself, Ryan. You must trust in the Lord and pray for his protection. There is great power in the name of Jesus against a spirit such as that. Papa spoke some words low to Keiko, who, in turn, strode across to say a few words to the medicine man. Though Papa bowed his head and Ryan could hear his low supplications, she couldn't seem to take her eyes off the confrontation taking place, nor lift up any other prayer except Jesus. The village doctor started toward her and Papa. Keiko stepped into his path and placed one hand to the man's chest. There was a fierceness in Keiko's stance that Ryan didn't remember seeing before. Behind her, Yanni moaned loudly. June cooed a few soothing words and fussed over her. But the woman did indeed sound like she might be dying. Ryan's fingernails bit into her palms. At the sound of Yanni's great distress, the medicine man threw up one hand and said a few angry words. But Keiko stood his ground, and after a moment the man turned and stormed away. Despite the fact that June had managed to shush their keening, the whole village, it seems, still stood gathered about the hut and had just witnessed the medicine man stomp off in a fit of rage. Papa lifted his focus from his prayers and returned his attention to Ryan. He continued as though nothing out of the ordinary had just happened. "'Tis just a birthing. Now you must get her to lie down. June passed the instructions to Yanni who reluctantly collapsed onto the blanket as requested. Papa nodded. Now, palpate her stomach and tell me what you feel. Remember, we've done this before, you and I. The head will be firm, hard, and round. Feel for it. Papa placed a hanky over his mouth and coughed into it a couple times. Helplessly, Ryan looked down at the woman who writhed and whimpered and rubbed her belly. Her faith was so lacking, yet it seemed that once again God was asking her to simply offer what she had, limited though it might be. Heaving in a fortifying breath, Ryan complied with Papa's orders. Head is high, Papa, just under her ribs. The babe does indeed face the wrong direction. 
The feel of that little head so high up sent a wave of certain fear shooting through Ryan. The medicine man might be right in the end, but the first rule of medicine Papa had taught her was to never let your patient see your fear, no matter how strong it might be. Is there room to turn the child, or is it already too far down? Ryan assessed the situation, and as another contraction bore down on the woman, she realized with dread the babe was too far into the canal to turn. She shook her head at Papa, doing her best to keep her breaths from banging against her teeth. But Papa remained as calm as the placid lake. Fine, then we'll have to carefully watch that the cord doesn't get clamped off at the last. But it's not impossible to deliver. Papa smiled. You yourself came into the world in this manner. You always have been determined to do things your own way. That bit of information did not help calm her tremors since her mother had died in childbirth. Papa seemed to be able to read her thoughts. Not all endings are the same, child. Now, he motioned her back to the task at hand. Get her on her hands and knees. As soon as the task was accomplished, the woman's waters broke. Good. Papa's voice soothed over Ryan. Now then, reach in and grasp the feet gently. Think of your work as more that of a guide. You are not to pull, at least not yet. Ryan followed his instructions and felt the soft smoothness of the baby's feet beneath her fingers. She offered a tremulous smile to June. You can tell her to push now. June spoke quietly to the woman, and with the next contraction, Yoni's face stretched into a grimace as every muscle in her body tensed. She pushed with all her might. Jesus, you know my limitations and lack of faith, and yet I do believe that you can work wonders when you choose to step in. Please, let this be one of those times. So many lives are at stake if I fail here. Two little feet emerged into the daylight, but Ryan's heart nearly stilled in her chest. Papa, the cord. Papa dabbed some moisture on his upper lip with the back of one hand. All you can do is get the babe out as quickly as you can, child. Ryan's breaths came short and fast. Jesus, please. When you walk through the water, I will be there. The words were so clear, it was as though someone near had spoken them aloud. Yet Ryan knew no one nearby had said the words. Jesus. A quaver coursed through her, and with it a need to hurry the birthing along as quickly as she could. June, tell her she must push with all her might. June bent over Yoni and whispered into her ear, speaking low but urgently. And with the next contraction, Ryan was satisfied to feel the babe emerge a few more inches. She tugged gently to hasten the process as best she could. Still, she feared for the child. Was the cord pinched? Was it getting the life-sustaining support it needed during this critical time? Again, she urged the woman as she saw the next contraction tightening the woman's abdomen. Push! After three more contractions, the baby boy's head and shoulders were all that was left to birth. She gently hooked two fingers around the umbilical cord. The part she could feel felt cold, lifeless. The babe's wrinkly body was limp and cool. Despair threatened to overwhelm her. Jesus, please. It was the only prayer she could seem to formulate. With the next contraction, Ryan gently eased out first one shoulder and then the other. And with one more contraction and a bit of help on her part, the babe slid into her hand. The tiny boy lay in her hands without response. His little mouth hung open, but he made no move to try and breathe. A ripple of sound filtered through the gathered crowd, and despite the fact that she couldn't understand any of the words, the tone was one of acceptance of death. Turn the child upside down, Ryan. Rub his back firmly. Now! Papa hadn't sounded so forceful in a long time. Hand shaking, Ryan turned the boy. She hooked two fingers on either side of his neck and curled them over his shoulders to hold on to him. And she rubbed his little back hard. Come on, little one. Father in heaven, life, please, for this child. She rubbed him again and gently whacked his back with the heel of her hand. The baby flinched and gave a tiny bleat of protest. From the crowd, a sound of awe lifted. The awe was echoed in Ryan's own spirit. Oh, thank you, Jesus. She turned the baby over. At the bright light in his face, 
the infant balled up his fists and screamed in earnest. Ryan couldn't withhold a soft chuckle. That's right, Miss One. <laughs> That's right. Just breathe. Joy pulsed through her. A baby boy. Whole and beautiful in every way. A grin stretched Ryan's face from ear to ear as she tied off and cut the cord and laid the baby against his mother's chest. You have a fine, strong son. The woman seemed content despite the communication barrier, and she clutched at one of Ryan's hands in thanks. Yanni then turned to face her son. She murmured in cool to the baby, and such a swell of happiness rose up in Ryan she had to step away from the intimate scene. Papa looked all done in. Keiko, if you wouldn't mind, could you please see Papa back to our hut while I wash up? The man nodded, and Ryan was so thankful for his help. Down at the lake, she sluiced water and soap over her hands and arms. Her sloppy grin didn't seem to have anywhere else to be. Thank you, Jesus. We did it. Together. Thank you. She had just saved a life. Maybe two. And maybe had prevented a war. Certainly sometimes God seemed shockingly silent in the face of appalling evil. But today she had felt him almost nearer than Papa had been. And certainly sometimes her gift would not be enough. But sometimes it was enough. Today, combined with a bit of prayer and God's help, it had been enough. Trent swung the machete with vigor as he and his men blazed through a large marsh full of tall grasses. Pillars of smoke had appeared on the horizon, and the local guide had insisted the fastest way to get there was across this marshy bog, instead of cutting all the way around the large hill that stood between them and their destination at one end of the marshland. But he was beginning to think the man might have led them astray. His feet had been wet since mid-morning, and twice they'd had to fight off a crocodile, thankfully small ones. He was more concerned for the condition of his men's feet than his own. He was in the best get-up for traipsing through land like this of all his men, none of whom had any shoes on. He was just about ready to call a halt and question the man further about this shortcut, when ahead their guide gave a triumphant shout, Tina Fika! Trent hoped that meant they had arrived, and wished for the umpteenth time that day that Keiko could have accompanied him. He certainly could have used the man's translation skills, but had felt it more important to leave Miss Hunter under the guard of a man he trusted. He did have one man with him who spoke rudimentary Swahili, so he was able to communicate with his men. They climbed out of the bog, and he gave the men thirty minutes to rest and dry their feet before they would be required to traipse across the rocky terrain. The smoke was dissipating now, so likely they would be too late to be of help but maybe someone would be there who could give them some more information about who was attacking the villages and where they were taking the people. If he could just catch up to the man so he could verify if he was indeed Khalifa or not, that would give him a better idea of how to proceed. It was not unheard of for tribal chieftains to go to war with one another and sell the captives to traders passing through. Perhaps Khalifa wasn't the instigator, but merely the beneficiary of all these uprisings. Yet somehow. Trent doubted the man had nothing to do with the terror that had been ripping a path across the continent. And the most infuriating part? Even if he had instigated every attack, Khalifa was doing nothing illegal. Yet. Which in itself was a slap in the face of God. Abetting the trade in human flesh was the fact that the Anglo raiders had dehumanized the natives in the eyes of much of the world. Trent had never understood how someone could think so low of another human being. The stockings he'd laid out on a rock had dried quickly in the heat of the sun, as had his breeches. His boots were still damp, but they'd have to do. They needed to get moving. He gave a call, and the men roused from their rest and were ready to march before he had tied the last lace on his boots. When they arrived at the village, it was to find it had been decimated. Crowls kicked in. Nearly every hut set afire. Many people slain where they'd fallen as they ran to escape. Trent's heart sank, and his teeth clenched in anger at the destruction and horror all around him. All the deceased were either old or young, just like at every village they had passed for the previous several weeks. Trent squatted next to a small girl who had fallen backward, 
with a spear in her chest, just before she would have reached the cover of tall grass at the edge of the village. She couldn't be more than five. She apparently had turned to face her attacker at the last moment. Her eyes were wide and terrified. He fisted a hand and placed it over his mouth as he gently closed her staring eyes. A knot of anger formed in his stomach, what he wouldn't give to be able to get his hands on the men who had done this right about now. He thought back to Ryan's questions. How could God allow such evil to go on unchecked and not step in? Where was the good in something like this? He sighed. Father, forgive me. But when I see pillage like this, I have to question why you allow it. What did this child do to deserve a death like this? The heavens rang with silence. Next to him, the grass rustled. He leapt back and drew his machete in one hand and pistol in the other, ready to defend himself in case an animal emboldened by the scent of death was set for an attack. A soft gasp and another rustle of grass was all he encountered, however. There was a survivor. You! He sheathed his machete and snapped his fingers at his translator. I have a survivor here. Tell them it is okay to come out, that we won't hurt them. The man approached and squatted down. He murmured some quiet words toward the stand of thick brown grass. And after a moment, there was another rustle, and the blades parted to reveal a small, tear-stained face. The girl was young and terrified. She didn't move fully into the open, but examined Trent carefully from head to toe, and then asked the man squatting next to him a question. She was obviously nervous that he might be another slave trader, come to finish what the previous raiders had left undone. Trent unslung his canteen and held it out to her with a little shake and a gentle smile. This child could be the break they'd been hoping for. Could she have seen anything? Surely she had. The girl took a hesitant step away from the relative safety of the concealing grass. She eyed the canteen with a frown, obviously unsure what it was. Removing the cork, Trent tilted back his head and poured a splash of water into his mouth, in demonstration, then held it back toward her. She had to be thirsty. It was straight up noon, and she'd probably been hiding for hours. Eyes widening as she realized what he was offering her, she clutched at the canteen greedily and tipped it back, taking long, desperate draughts of the revitalizing liquid. After a moment, she wiped at her mouth with one tiny palm and handed the canteen back to him with a slight bend of her knees and thanks. The girl couldn't be more than seven or eight. Trent reached into his rucksack and pulled out a mango he'd plucked along the path early that morning. He squatted down and held the fruit out to her. The girl didn't hesitate this time, but took the fruit and bit through the skin without ceremony. She used her teeth to quickly pull back the thick skin in a half circle around the mango, and then ate the pulp with gusto before moving on to the other half. Once again, when she had finished and tossed the seed and skin away into the thick brush, she dipped her knees and pressed her palms together in the tribal way of saying thank you. Trent tipped her a nod then looked at his guide, who had sat quietly by, waiting for the girl to finish. Ask her if she saw the men who raided her village. The man spoke low to the girl. Her eyes widened, and she chattered a few phrases with a trembling voice. Trent waited patiently for the guide to translate for him. She say, the raid came just as the sky's day lamp lifted above the horizon. Many men attacked from all sides. She and her sister, he pointed subtly to the dead child, ran. Did she see the leaders? The translator murmured to her again. Tiny hands gesturing, she responded. The translator turned a surprised look on Trent. After the chaos at the first of the attack, the raiders made all the villagers gather in the Boileau. She says there were two men, two leaders. Trent leaned forward. Can she describe them? The translator spoke to the girl again. She responded with a bit of a warble in her soft voice. The man looked to Trent. She says one man is very tall, with very dark skin, and a white patch in his hair. The other is an Arab, wearing a grey kufia. Trent's stomach clenched. Khalifa wore a grey kufia.
and he recognized the description of the other man as one of the Zanzibaris who had been with Khalifa at Commodore Cornwall's estate. The Arab is in charge of a caravan of women only. The other was taking anyone, man or woman strong enough to work, that the Arab passed over. The first man only took those women who were fat. Trent frowned. Fat? The translator scratched his head as though unsure of the correct Swahili word to use. It is the village way to say, how you say, good teeth, good skin, young, no babies yet. Beautiful virgins? The translator snapped his fingers in recognition. That is the word, harem women, harem women. Trent stood slowly and let his focus blur into the horizon. The sultan got his concubines from Oman. Any women from here wouldn't be destined for the palace on Zanzibar, which meant whoever Khalifa was working for really was involved in an illegal smuggling of slaves. Because current laws only allowed for the transport of slaves to Zanzibar and no farther. Lou was right. They needed to figure out if Khalifa was using Harcourt ships to smuggle with their full knowledge, or if he was working for someone else, right under Harcourt noses. In the meantime, it had been over two weeks since he left Ryan and her father, and his men were too few to confront Khalifa anyhow. The best he could do was send runners ahead, something he should have thought of earlier. He glanced at his translator. Send men ahead. They must hurry and get ahead of the slave caravan and its raiders. Go to every village in their path and warn them they are coming. The man looked skeptical. This is the way of things here, is he? The word has already spread. The villagers will already know of the raiders. Trent scrubbed at the back of his neck. I know, but it is our human duty to try to warn them further. Send the runners and send some men to hunt. We should eat meat tonight. Yes, is he? The men were dispatched with haste, and Trent felt only a fraction more relieved. He wouldn't rest easy until he had the cowards bound hand and foot and headed for Her Majesty's courts. Would that all slavery could be made illegal. He glanced around the village once more. He wasn't naive enough to think a law would stop all of this, but it might put a stop to such open desecration and destruction and save the lives of many. It took them the rest of the day to bury the dead. After the last corpse had been laid to rest, the men gathered around the small cook fire to eat the mzima and meat from the gazelle the hunting team had returned with earlier. Trent made sure the young girl, who told them her name was Niimbo, Song, received the first plate. Her eyes looked weary beyond their years, and he knew grief must be tearing her up inside. He gently laid a hand on her head, and then squeezed her shoulder. It appeared Miss Hunter would have another charge once they returned to the village. He left the girl to her food and took a portion of his own. We return to the lake at first light, Trent informed his men, for now we will rest. This village, pillaged though it was, would be as good a place to do so as any. The raiders wouldn't be returning here, at least not so soon and there were at least a couple roofs still standing that would serve well as shelter for the night. Part Two One evening, just as the sun was dipping below the surface of the lake for its nightly swim, Ryan found Papa sitting on the beach, taking in the golden glory gilding the surface of the water. Ryan sank down next to him, and handed him the bowl of Nzima Ndi Ndiwo June had prepared for them. Tonight's cornflower patty was accompanied by stewed game and tomatoes. Glancing into his bowl, Papa asked, What manner of animal is this? Ryan crinkled her nose. I was afraid to ask. His warm chuckle drifted across the dusk. Probably better that way. Say the blessing, would you, child? Ryan thanked God for the benefit of hot food to eat, even if it was of unknown origin, and this brought another chuckle from Papa, which warmed her heart. It had been too long since he'd laughed so freely. A soft sigh slipped from her father's lips as they sat to eating in cicada-serenaded silence. 
After a moment, he gestured to the sunset. Beautiful, isn't it? The champagne light had puddled into distinct swatches of guava and mango now, and with the palm tree just to their right silhouetted against the sky, it had been some time since Ryan had seen anything so beautiful. Stunning, she agreed. Papa dipped another morsel of the corn patty into the stew. Your mother loved sunsets. Ryan still, knowing instantly that he was speaking of the woman who had given her birth, not the woman she had called mother all her life. Setting his half-finished bowl aside, Papa licked his thumb and offered, Did I ever tell you that her mother came from this tribe? This very village, in fact. Ryan's brows lifted. My mother's mother? Papa nodded. Why? She was captured from here back in the early twenties. Silas Coventry bought her from the Zanzibar slave market. Silas was your mother's father. He sold Arabella to me in 1845. The bottom seemed to drop from her stomach. She'd only ever known that her birth mother's father had been a plantation owner, but never his identity. Silas Coventry? is my grandfather? Papa nodded. Ryan set her own bowl aside, not sure she could stomach any more food on top of the bitter taste currently in her mouth. Silas Coventry was one of the cruelest men on the whole island of Zanzibar. His plantation thrived on the backs of slaves who were often abused to the point of death. Is my grandmother still alive? Papa shook his head. I'm afraid not. It was her death that caused your mother to rebel to the point that he sold her to me to be shut of the trouble of her. Ryan felt a little sick to her stomach. Did Silas kill her, do you think? My grandmother. Uncertainty hissed from between his teeth as Papa rubbed the back of his neck. I'm not sure. Arabella never wanted to talk about it. Ryan glanced around the village. So partly the reason you are here is out of guilt. Nay, child. I came to terms with my guilt many years ago, and am ever so grateful that all my past sin is covered under the blood of the Saviour. We can't escape the consequences of our sin, but we can be free of the guilt with the help of the Lord. He rested his forearms against his knees and continued, Nay, I'm here because I felt a distinct call of the Lord to come preach to these people. One day while in prayer, I clearly saw this lake. He swept a gesture to the orange waters before them. And along the shore of this lake, I clearly saw this village. It was like a map had been sketched for me. And a voice said to me, Matthew 28, 19. What does that verse say, Papa? Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Papa sighed and took up a twig from the sand beside him. He set to breaking it into small bits. That was many years ago, child. I tried to talk Anne into coming with me, bringing the family, but she would have nothing to do with coming here to live in the wilds, especially not to reach the village of the woman who was your mother. Tossing down what was left of the twig, Papa spread his hands. So when I knew I was dying, I thought what better way to solve two problems at once. I could fulfill what I'd felt the Lord calling me to these many years, and I could free my family from having to watch me slowly die. Ryan squeezed her father's hand. I'm sorry she wouldn't come with you, Papa. The silence lingered for a moment before Papa said, I hurt her most severely, child. I broke our vows and misused her trust. Not much can amend for that, no matter that I've attempted to apologize in innumerable ways and tried to prove myself worthy of her trust once more. Now in these my last days, I can only pray that she will be able to let go of her bitterness ere she passes on into eternity. It grieves me that my sin might be the cause of her separation from God for all of eternity, for she's never been able to forgive me for what I did. A frown furrowed her brow. Whatever do you mean by that? Surely you can't mean... Just as I say, child. Age-spotted hands scrubbed over his wrinkled face, and then he draped his arms wearily over his knees. It's part of the Lord's Prayer, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. 
Then Jesus also said in the verses following, For if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. Puzzlement tugged at Ryan's brow. Yet aren't we saved by grace alone? Papa nodded. And yet, if we can't bring ourselves to respond in obedience to commands so clearly laid out in God's word for us, can we honestly claim that we fully placed our faith in God? Ryan thought of Khalifa, who had first attacked her in the Harcourt's garden, and then so abusively maltreated Nyanja after she'd lost her leg to the crocodile. Could she ever bring herself to forgive a man like that? And what about a man like Chief Huang Kulu? Did a man who would whip and browbeat a woman deserve forgiveness? The next thought stilled the breath in her lungs. And her mother? The woman who had constantly belittled her and made her aware of how inadequately she measured up. Could she bring herself to forgive her? Apparently seeing the quandary expressed in her features, Papa rested one hand at the back of her neck. Do you remember the parable? of the unforgiving servant, Ryan. He owed the king of his country a great debt, but when he begged for forgiveness, the king granted it to him. Then the servant promptly went out and beat a man who owed him only a few cents. Word got back to the king, and the man was brought back before him, declared wicked, and delivered to the torturers. The lesson that parable points out is that we who have been forgiven so much in the face of God's perfection ought to realize how little harm has actually been done to us by people who misuse us. When God has forgiven us for so much, and in fact made us perfect in his sight, only by our belief in him, how can we in turn refuse to offer that same forgiveness to others? It is out of a grateful heart for what our Saviour has done for us that we pass on that forgiveness. And if we can't find it in ourselves to offer forgiveness, then it is questionable whether we've actually understood the magnitude of what Christ did for us on the cross. Realization of how far she had to go to become more Christ-like washed through Ryan. Up aside, I don't say all that to make it seem like what I did to Anne was negligible. I understand it was a horrendous thing I did. And yet her burden now rests in finding the strength to step out into forgiveness. This is my prayer for her. Ryan's tears transformed the scene before her into an orange blur. All these years she had resented the way Mother treated her, always angry about little things, always keeping Ryan at arm's length, never satisfied with anything Ryan had tried to do to impress her. And now suddenly, even though Ryan had known in the back of her mind all these years where the bitterness must stem from, it became clear why. She put herself in her mother's place having to raise the child brought forth from an adulterous affair perpetrated by her husband. She suddenly had a magnitude of sympathy for the woman. What pain mother must feel each time she looked at the child that resulted from that affair. What bitterness. And yet, if she could have brought herself to forgive Papa, what a better relationship they could have had with each other. And if she could bring herself to forgive Mother, they too would have a better relationship the kind Ryan had longed for all her years growing up. Maybe it wasn't too late. Ryan dashed at the tears coursing down her cheek. After a long moment, she whispered, I will join you in praying for her so, Papa, and for my own. Somewhere in the brush behind them, an owl hooted, and the guttural cry of a startled bush baby grated across the night. Waves caressed the shore, and a breeze rustled through the leaves of the palm trees and for the first time in months, Ryan felt content. It had been two weeks and a half since Trent and his men had left the village. Dusky pink tendrils of the sunrise still wisped across the dome of the sky, even though the sun floated well above the horizon now. Ryan stood at the edge of the lake and let the coolness of the morning water lap over her feet. Several times over the past few days, she had looked in on Yanni and the new babe, and the boy seemed to be thriving well. After the safe birth of Yanni's baby, Keiko's father, Chief Panda, had sent a runner to tell Wonkulu about the birth of his son. The messenger had returned with Wonkulu, 
and he'd been given a special dispensation from Chief Banda to enter the village. Despite much grumbling from those of his tribe who travelled here to escape the man's poor management of his own chieftainship. Also, since the safe birth of the baby boy, more of the villagers had been emboldened to attend Papa's services. Not as many as Papa would have liked, but more than had been coming previously. And yet, despite that seemingly good news, Ryan's heart was heavy today. This morning she had awoken in the wee hours before any of the birds had even decided to greet the new day. At first she hadn't been able to place the reason she'd woken so suddenly. She'd lain in the darkness, listening, but her straining ears could pick out no sounds. And that was when it hit her. She lurched out of bed. Papa! She dashed across the room. The breaths that had rattled in his throat every night for the past few weeks were still and silent. Terror clawed at her. Not yet. She wasn't ready to lose him yet. Papa? The word was barely audible as she crept closer. She was almost afraid to touch him, could barely make out his shadowed form in the dim glow of moonlight filtering under the door. She held her breath, forced herself to reach out. Papa jolted at her touch, flipped over, and grabbed her arm. She gasped, half in relief, half startled at his quick movements. It's me, Papa. Just me. You were breathing so quietly. I came to check and make sure you were all right. I'm fine, daughter. Papa squinted at the amount of light coming under the door. Try to sleep some more. It won't be morning for another few hours yet. Yes, Papa. But despite her attempts to do just that, sleep had evaded her for the rest of the night, and the certainty of her impending loss had grown heavier with each passing hour. One time she was going to check on him, and he would not be fine. He would be gone. On top of that realization was the weight of what had happened when she'd gone to check on Yoni and the babe this morning. Eyes gritty from her lack of sleep, Ryan had set out at first light with a small basket of things she had made for the baby. A soft blanket she had cut down from one of Papa's old shirts, a pair of booties she had crocheted with her last length of yarn, and a small and very deficient doll for the baby's older sister, which she'd made with the scraps left over after making the blanket. Despite her scare over Papa, her heart had felt fairly light this morning, and she'd been at the edge of the clearing before Yanni's hut with the basket on her arm when she'd heard the screeching and the tiny wail of the newborn baby. Without thinking, she burst into the hut. Certain something was very wrong. It took but a moment for her eyes to adjust to the dim interior after the weak dawn light outside, and when they did, it was to find Yanni cowed against one wall with one kulu leaning over her grinding out a stream of words Ryan was, for the first time, glad she could not understand. The babe lay on the mat across the room with his big sister, not quite yet too, doing her best to shush and comfort his crying. Ryan's eyes adjusted a little more, and that was when she noticed Yoni had fresh blood marring the arms she'd curled over her head, and one Kulu had a whip in his hands. Ryan's anger bubbled up and boiled over the top so quickly she hardly knew what she was doing. One moment she was standing in the doorway with a basket of gifts over her arm, and the next moment she was by Wankulu's side with the captain's pistol pressed to the man's temple. Drop that whip this instant, you miserable cur! The man's eyes widened slightly, though whether it was because no woman had ever dared to speak to him thus, or due to the volume of her order, Ryan wasn't sure. The man's hand twitched, and the flails of the whip lurched her way but Ryan thumped the point of the pistol into the man's head with a good deal of force. Don't make me! She prayed he could not detect her trembling in the dark of the room. Slowly his fingers relaxed from around the handle, and the whip fell to the ground near Yanni's feet. Now out! Ryan tipped her head toward the door. And you had better believe that Chief Banda will hear about this the moment I have the opportunity to tell him. She didn't care if the man couldn't understand a word she said. She felt certain her tone conveyed her massive displeasure. With a grunt, he exited the hut. And while Yanni scrambled across the room and gathered the wailing baby into her arms, Ryan eased out a tremulous lungful of air and kept her gun trained on the doorway, lest he should change his mind and come back. Yanni crooned softly to the little one, and after only a moment, his wails turned to soft snuffles. After calming the babe, Yoni managed to convey that Wonkulu was trying to force her to return to his village with him, 
and she had told him she didn't want to go. Ryan went straight to the chief's hut after leaving Yoni's, and the man was livid when Keiko translated her story of what had just happened. Keiko had assured Ryan that Wonkulu would be escorted from the village the moment he was found, and that he would not be allowed to return. Now, the waves grew a little stronger and tugged at the tops of her ankles. She lifted her skirts. She'd gone back to wearing skirts almost two weeks past, and tipped her face to catch a bit more of the breeze. And it struck her. Wonkulu was doing to his wife what Ryan had wanted God to do to some people. Wonkulu had been trying to force his wife to return to his village with him, just as Ryan had wanted God to forcefully intervene in some of the atrocities she'd witnessed recently. Yet force was no proper way to show love. The ultimate sacrifice of true love was giving people free will. Free will meant that sometimes one man's choices would bring hurt upon someone else. She considered the question she had lifted to Captain Dawson just after the attack on Nyanja that had left her a cripple with only one leg. Some bad things that happened were not a result of man's choice to harm another. Some, it seemed, should be easily preventable by a loving God. How could a good God let such things happen? Nyanja losing her leg, for instance. Yet Nyanja had told her not long ago about how grateful she was to be free of Khalifa's abusive ownership. She would not have gained her freedom had she not lost her leg. So it could be said that God had used the bad to bring about a greater good for Nyanja and Moyo. But then there was Papa. Certainly he'd made his share of mistakes. One of them had resulted in her birth. But from those mistakes he'd realized the error of his ways and had given his life over to God. He dedicated his life from that time to this by serving others but God had allowed him to be struck down by a disease that was slowly eating away at him, day by day. She recalled the verse that had come to her as though spoken from the very mouth of God as she'd been delivering Yoni's baby boy. When you walk through the waters, I will be there. God promised to be there, to be a comforter, to be present in the hard times, and she believed it. Another verse spoke about God working all things for the good of those who were called by his name. She believed that too. The struggle was in seeing how God was doing that. Perhaps if Papa had never grown sick, he never would have worked up his courage to come to this village where he so strongly believed God had called him. It was quite possible. But for the moment, Ryan gave up on the answers. Father, I don't suppose I have to know all the reasons why. Just help me to keep my trust in you. To know that you will never leave me, nor forsake me, no matter what you ask me to go through. Slowly, as she prayed, her heavy heart began to ease. And finally she felt ready to face her day, though she knew by the end of it she would be feeling her short night and stressful morning to their fullest. She retrieved her shoes and headed toward the hut to waken Papa. They needed to get on with their day. It was mid-afternoon, just after she and Papa had shut down the clinic for the day, when a commotion rose from the outskirts of the village. Ryan's heart lurched with hope. Was the captain returned? She rushed from the clinic, drying her hands on a scrap of toweling. And there he was, striding into the village at the head of his men, his gaze drilling into hers. As though he were a compass needle and she were north, he strode straight to her. He searched her over from the top of her head to the swaying hem of her skirt. Miss Hunter. He touched his forehead and offered the sketch of a bow. Her hands trembled with the desire to pull him into a welcoming embrace, so she thrust them behind her back before she could do something inappropriate. Captain. Commotion swelled around them as villagers poured into the clearing from every direction. But for Ryan, it was almost as though a curtain of privacy had been dropped around just the two of them. The captain leaned closer, a devilish grin tipping up his lips. No matter how I try to prepare myself to be stoic at the sight of you, your beauty always takes my breath away. It mocks me and makes me realize what a weak-willed man I am. Ryan's mouth went dry at the blatant compliments that were so unlike him. She clenched her hands even more tightly around the towel behind her back, feeling the warmth of pleasure that brushed her cheeks. And yet, She knew without a doubt 
that were she to reciprocate his attentions, he would backpedal faster than if she were a swaying cobra. Let's not forget about your woman in the Americas, Captain, the captain startled. My what? She let her upraised brow reveal her peak. Could he really be trying to deny it? After he'd just made it clear to her a few weeks past that he had reasons why not could grow between them? What other reason could there be? His scrutiny remained steady, but she had no desire to meet him in a challenge at the moment. Her gaze dropped, and that was when she noticed the wide-eyed child practically clinging to the captain's side. Who's this? She softened her tone. The captain rested a hand on the girl's head. This is Nyimbo. He cleared his throat. She lost her family, so I brought her home with us. But let us not get off the subject. I don't know what you think, but... Ryan ignored the man and squatted down to put herself more on the girl's level. She extended one hand. Moni, she greeted. The child bent her knees as she took the proffered hand. Moni tu, she responded. Ryan stood and spoke to the captain, even while extending one hand to the girl. She looks hungry and could certainly use a bath. I'll take care of her. Good afternoon to you, Captain. The little girl followed her lead without hesitation, and Ryan led her across the sand toward the hut she and Papa shared. Miss Hunter? The captain was only trying to waylay her escape. She kept walking, pretending she hadn't heard him. Ryan! A touch of irritation burnt the edges of the word, even though it was accompanied by a chuckle. She almost halted, but then clenched her jaw and forced herself to keep walking. She refused to allow the man to toy with her emotions. The next day, just after chapel, only two patients waited to be treated. Both injuries were minor, and she had them cleaned and bandaged within a few minutes. Papa declared he was heading back to the hut to lie down for a bit, and since that was not unusual, Ryan let him go without worry. She stepped out into the zephyr that kissed the shore and shaded her eyes from the bright sunlight. Just down the beach, Nyanja practiced on the crutches she'd become quite adept at using, June by her side. Ryan hadn't spoken with either woman for several days, even though they almost always attended Papa's chapel services. But generally, she and Papa went straight to working the clinic after chapel, and now she suddenly realized how much she was missing female company. Oh, what she wouldn't give to be able to walk into the stone town house right this moment and share a silly conversation with Jasmine, or even a stolid one with Mother. With a huff that reminded her to return to reality, Ryan called out to the women and hurried after them, intent on asking after Moyo and seeing how Nyanja was tolerating pain now that she'd quit taking the opiates. The women waited for her, and when asked, Nyanja assured her that she was well, and Moyo was thriving here in the village. She and Niimbo were currently playing together at the water's edge down the beach. Ryan was glad to see her new young charge at least out of the hut. She'd hardly cajoled two words out of the girl yesterday. Likely not surprising, considering what she'd been through so recently. June and Nianja leaned close to one another and resumed their conversation in low tones. Disappointed that the interaction had been so short and that she seemed to be intruding on their conversation, Ryan folded her arms against the breeze that had picked up quite briskly off the lake. Okay, well, please let me know if you need anything. She offered a parting smile that she hoped didn't look too self-pitying, and then turned to go. Behind her, June said something, and Nianja replied. Miss Hunter? June called her to a stop. Hope soaring, Ryan turned. Yes? Perhaps you could answer a question for us, an uneasy feeling lodged in Ryan's chest. She brushed a strand of hair from her face. I can try. June motioned for her to join them as they walked. Nianja and I have been talking about your father's words from the chapel. Ryan's heart rate picked up. They wanted to know about spiritual truths. Oh, she certainly wasn't the best one to help them with that. Yet something kept her walking with them. Yes? Yesterday, your father spoke about Jesus loving the world so much that he died on a cross for us. Ryan nodded. Papa had drawn a cross in the dirt floor of the chapel to show the villagers what one looked like, and then he had explained, using his medical knowledge, the horrifyingly slow death that took place on a cross. 
and he ended with a challenge for the people to take up their own crosses and follow Jesus, along with an explanation of what that meant. June pressed on. I used to attend the chapel on Commodore Cornwall's estate, so I have heard this story before. But Nyanja says, maybe this god is only for the Azungu, and not for the Chewa, or any other black tribe. No, Ryan suddenly longed more than anything for them to believe her next words. Jesus died for everyone. The two women looked at her skeptically. Then why don't we know any of our people who are serving this god? Ryan swallowed. You do? The words were out before she could think better of them. We do? Ryan nodded. Her heart was beating from the region of her throat now. If she continued with her explanation and told them of her heritage, there would be no going back. Word would spread. Captain Dawson would learn of it, and that might be the final brick in the wall of rationales that seemed intent on keeping them apart. And yet, Perhaps this was the very reason the Lord had directed her path to this village. This was something she could offer that not even Papa could. She swallowed, took a breath. Did you know that my mother's mother was from your tribe? She lived in this very village, on this very lake. She swept a gesture to the water. Both June and Nyanja came to a stop. June's voice was incredulous when she asked. You carry the blood of the Chewa in your veins? Ryan smiled, nodded. My grandmother was taken as a slave from these waters, and my mother was my father's slave before he gave up his own ways and started living for the God he now tells you about. I can assure you that Jesus loves all people, no matter the color of their skin or the blood that flows in their veins. June and Nyanja laughed incredulously and chattered a few phrases to each other. This news makes us very happy, June said. Ryan smiled. Yes, it is good. Ryan! From down the beach, the captain dashed toward her. Ryan's heart plummeted in her chest. She turned to face him, but resisted voicing all the fears pounding through her. Trent came to a stop before her and pulled in a breath. It's your father. You need to come now. Without a word, she lifted her skirts and took off at a run toward the village. Where? A hut? Yes, Trent jogged at her heels. She was too afraid to ask any more questions, and when a moment later she burst through the door and found Papa lying on his bed, looking pale, but alive and breathing, her strength left her. She collapsed on her knees by his bed. Papa, what is it? His hand trembled as it fumbled across the coverlet to find hers. It's time, dear girl. I can feel it. The words were barely a wheeze across his lips. It couldn't be. He'd stood at the front of the chapel and preached a sermon only a bit ago. Ryan wanted to protest. She wanted to urge him to fight. But nothing she thought to say seemed right in that moment. She clamped her teeth against the well that wanted to escape her. I'm here, Papa. I'm right here. His fingers tightened around hers. God gave me more time. Than I expected. He struggled for the breath to say the words. Shh, Papa, don't speak, just rest. Yes, rest. His eyes drifted closed, and this time Ryan couldn't suppress a sob. She knelt by him until her knees were almost too cramped to move, and then she worked her way to her feet and paced the confines of the room. Captain Dawson sat on a stool across the room, Elbows on his knees as he whittled a small stick with his pocket knife. His face grim. Papa's breaths rattled, but at least they remained mostly steady. Every once in a while the wheezing would stop and Ryan would freeze, certain this was the end. But then Papa would stop breathing again, and her relief would set her to pacing anew. After several hours, the captain strode from the room and returned a few minutes later with a bowl of broth and a corn cake. He took her arm and led her to her cot, urging her to sit as he held the ball out to her. You are going to need your strength. She tried to push the food away. I can't. Yes, you can. His words left no room for compromise. He took the ball she handed back to him, and he squatted before her. Lifting a spoon of broth, he gave her a pleading look. Captain, please. He used her speech as an opportunity to slip the spoon between her lips 
and she gave up. It would take less strength to comply, and would certainly be less messy, and she was too weary to fight him on this. She swiped at the broth on her chin and took the bowl from him, broke the corn patty into the broth, and set to eating, giving him one last glower for good measure. With a satisfied nod, he left her to it, and stepped over by her father's side. Part Three They passed the night hours together, fitfully dozing, pacing, pausing when Papa's breathing stopped and starting up again only when he resumed. The rattle of death's looming victory gargled at the back of Papa's throat, and Ryan wanted to put her hands over her ears, or maybe run from the room more than once that night. Then just as dawn was breathing light against the horizon, Ryan lay down next to Papa's pallet and rested her head on the side of his blanket. Papa's hand fumbled across the coverlet and found her, patting gently. Hope burgeoning, she rose up and took his hand. Good morning, Papa. Ryan. His voice was dry and scratchy, and she scrambled to fetch him a drink of water, holding the cup carefully to his lips as the captain lifted him slightly and held his head steady. But after only two swallows, he waved a hand weakly to indicate he'd had enough. The captain settled him back against the pallet. Papa's gaze found hers. Would you? Read to me. Of course, Papa. He eased out a rattling breath. Psalm 10. Ryan started to rise to fetch the Bible, but Trent was already by her side, handing her the book. She accepted it from him. Thank you. The captain squeezed her shoulder gently in a gesture of support, and she flipped through the pages until she found the psalm. Then, in as steady a voice as she could muster, she began reading. Psalm 10 Why do you stand afar off, O Lord? Why do you hide in times of trouble? A sob gathered at the back of her throat and threatened to prevent her from finishing the psalm, but the captain's steady hand on her shoulder gave her the strength she needed to go on. The wicked, in his pride, persecutes the poor. Let them be caught in the plots which they have devised. For the wicked boasts of his heart's desire. He blesses the greedy and renounces the Lord. The wicked in his proud countenance does not seek God. God is in none of his thoughts. His ways are always prospering. Your judgments are far above, out of his sight. As for all his enemies, he sneers at them. He has said in his heart, I shall not be moved. I shall never be in adversity. His mouth is full of cursing and deceit and oppression. Under his tongue is trouble and iniquity. He sits in the lurking places of the villages. In the secret places he murders the innocent. His eyes are secretly fixed on the helpless. He lies and waits secretly as a lion in his den. He lies and waits to catch the poor. He catches the poor when he draws him into his net. So he crouches, he lies low, that the helpless may fall by his strength. He has said in his heart, God has forgotten. He hides his face. He will never see. Arise, O Lord. O God, lift up your hand. Do not forget the humble. Why do the wicked renounce God? He has said in his heart, you will not require an account. But you have seen, for you observe trouble and grief, to repay it by your hand. The helpless commits himself to you. You are the helper of the fatherless. Break the arm of the wicked and the evil man. Seek out his wickedness until you find none. The Lord is king forever and ever. The nations have perished out of his land. Lord, you have heard the desire of the humble. You will prepare their heart. You will cause your ear to hear. To do justice to the fatherless and the oppressed that the man of the earth may oppress no more. By the end, Ryan's voice was so choked that she could barely speak the words. Papa's hand found hers and squeezed gently. God will do justice to you, child. Do not be afraid.
Tears streamed down Ryan's cheeks, and she set the Bible aside, lest she soak the pages with her grief. She leaned over Papa. I'm going to be just fine, Papa. You go. She held her breath against the cry of protest and the compulsion to beg him to fight for life. Captain, Papa raised one hand feebly. Trent stepped around Ryan and took his hand. I'm here. Remember your promises. Trent wrapped both his hands around Papa's. I won't forget. Let us. Papa stretched a weak finger in the direction of his trunk. Foam flecked his lips now. Yes, Papa. I will find them. He seemed to relax then. His eyes dropped closed, and his hand went limp in the captain's grip. Carefully, the captain laid it down. Papa roused. My Bible. He flexed his fingers. Ryan retrieved it and handed it to him, and with his last remaining strength, he pulled the book onto his chest and hugged it to himself. Then his eyes closed, and sleep once more claimed him. Time passed, one agonizingly slow second after another. Ryan stayed by Papa's side, wiping from his lips the death foam that indicated he was slowly drowning, and trying to keep him as comfortable as possible. The captain tried to get her to leave the hut for a few minutes at noon to eat, but she adamantly refused him, and he gave up without too much protest but only when she took a few bites of the roast venison he'd brought to her. She felt numb and barely tasted the food. And then late in the afternoon, Papa finally drew his last breath, and the hut rang with silence. Kneeling by his pallet, Ryan waited, half hoping he would rally, and half praying that his battle on this plane was completed. After a few minutes, she wearily reached out to feel for a pulse, and found none. She dropped her head onto her arms, too overwhelmed to even cry just yet. The captain placed a hand gently on her head and then stepped outside, presumably to let those gathered know that Papa had passed. After a few long minutes, Ryan rose from her knees and looked down at the only man who'd ever known everything about her and still loved her. Taking up the towel, she wiped the foam from his lips one last time. She'd never felt such despair and desolation before. They draped her like a clinging fog, inescapable and heavy. How was she going to go on without him? Carefully, she brushed Papa's hair back from his face and straightened the collar on his shirt. She pried the Bible from beneath his limp fingers and laid his hands one atop the other. Her fingers rubbed at the smooth sheen his daily use had given to the leather of the book. Only this morning... Her fist curled around the spine of the Bible until it shook. Outside, the piercing keening she ought to have expected started up. First one lonely high-pitched voice, and then as others joined in, a chorus of them. All screeching shrilly at the top of their lungs. The sound of the village women mourning grated on Ryan's nerves and made her want to rage at the world. Before she realized her own intent, she hurled the Bible across the hut with a guttural cry. Splayed pages splattered against the mud wall and then fell to her bed. She stared at the ruffled mess, feeling immense guilt for having treated something so precious in such a manner. And then the first sob heaved up from inside her, followed by a second and a third. Her knees started to give, but then Trent was there, wrapping her in a firm embrace and pressing her head to his chest. She hadn't even known he'd returned. I'm here, Ryan. I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. She clung to him like he was life itself, gripping handfuls of his shirt and crying so hard no sound escaped except when she heaved for breath. How long they stood that way, she had no idea. But Trent stayed with her, murmuring soft words of comfort against her hair. Time seemed eternal, yet dead all in the same moment. Finally, she stood quiet, her cheek resting against the beat of Trent's heart, his shirt still fisted in one hand, but more loosely now. He smoothed her hair from her forehead in damp face, then dropped his cheek against the top of her head and simply held her, rocking gently. Through the open door of the hut, she could see Nyanja balancing carefully on her one leg as she stood respectfully in the crowd of wailing women, 
Moyo and Yimbo sat with forlorn expressions in the dust at Nyanja's feet. Ryan stood and swiped at the moisture on her face, but she couldn't pull herself away from the comfort of his embrace just yet. Did you hear the verses I read to Papa this morning? Trent stroked her hair again, burying his fingers in the curls at the back of her head. Yes, I heard. She rested one palm against her cheek. My faith is weak, Captain. I haven't had a chance to tell you about Chief Wonkulu. He came while you were away, and I caught him beating Yoni, his wife. He wanted her to return to his village with him, but she didn't want to go. And I realized that was how I had been wanting God to deal with the slavers, to force them to do his bidding. But in that flash of a moment, when I saw Wonkulu leaning over Yoni with that whip in his hand, I knew true love would never force someone to do something. She paused, thankful to hear that the keening outside seemed to be coming to a stop. How did she assemble all her jumbled thoughts together to make sense of them? Finally, she continued, I know that Nyanja is likely better off now that she is free of Khalifa, and perhaps that wouldn't have come about if she hadn't lost her leg. And I know that Papa is in a much better place now with no pain or suffering. And as stated, I know that true love never would use force. Yet still my heart wants to demand why God doesn't do more. She gestured to the two little girls, still visible out the door. Yimbo, for instance, why did she have to lose her entire family? Couldn't God have sent someone to help them in time? Trent eased back and crooked one finger under her chin, lifting her face to meet his gaze. I think you've just hit on the key. What if someone was supposed to step in and help? Yet in the freedom of choice, God's love demands. They chose not to act. Ryan's eyes widened a little at that. Would all her resentment and frustration toward God for failing to step in better be directed at people who had failed to fulfill their calling? Trent's gaze bore steadily into her own. I confess I've had the same questions. When I see the destruction slavery brings, I fear my doubts arise. And yet, God chooses to use people, Ryan. He tipped his head toward the village outside. He sent them you. He sent them you and me and your father. He followed that with a gesture toward Papa lying so still on his pallet. And he sent him you to be an encouragement and support in his last days. She blinked and her thoughts returned to the conversation she'd been in the middle of with June and Nianja when the captain had fetched her to Papa's side. Perhaps God had used her concern over Papa's health to bring her along, not only to take care of Papa, but to take Papa's place once he was gone. Trent caressed the line of her jaw, but his gaze wandered to the scene beyond the doorway. You and I, Ryan, we came kicking and screaming, but your father, he came with a willing heart and look how much good he did in the short time he was here. There's already a chapel and a clinic of sorts. What does that part of the psalm say? Do you remember? She pulled in a shuddering breath. To do justice to the fatherless and the oppressed, that the man of the earth may oppress no more, he murmured his agreement. I think the time when earthly mortals will oppress no more is yet to come. But in the meantime, we are here, and God wants to use us. We must take up our crosses, give our fleshly desires over to God so he can show us what he wants of us, just like he did for your father. Let us defend the fatherless and work for the oppressed as willing tools in his arsenal. Ryan nodded. I said, my faith is weak. Yet who else but God holds the words of life? I don't see how we can do anything else. She glanced at Papa, and another wave of tears coursed over her. On the other hand, I don't know if I have the strength to aid anyone. Trent lifted her face once more, brushing her tears away with his thumbs as he cupped her cheeks in his hands. I'm here. I'm not going anywhere. Lean on me, but mostly lean on the Lord. He will be your strength, the one who carries you through the trials of this life to the end of your days. She nodded. Yes. A wave of weariness so strong that it nearly took the strength from her knees tugged for her attention. She rubbed her eyes and willed herself to think. 
but Trent took her arm and directed her over to her bed across the room. Rest, Ryan. I will take care of preparing him. I promise to wake you in a few hours. She gave in to him, too weary to fight. Ryan was asleep almost before she could swing her legs up onto her pallet. Trent brushed her hair back from her face and felt the heaviness of the burden he now bore for her safety. Only a bit ago, when he'd stepped out to let the village know of the doctor's passing, Keiko had confided to Trent that Ryan had told June and Nianja she carried native blood. The news should have surprised him, but it hadn't, because suddenly so many things about the Hunter family had clicked into place. Ryan's dark looks compared to her siblings, Anne's constant aversion to and abrasive behavior toward Ryan, and Ryan Hunter's bent toward giving Ryan anything she could jolt him for. No, the news hadn't shocked him. What it had done was sent a wave of terror through him, because now, with Ryan Hunter passed on, it would be legal in every way for anyone to capture Ryan and sell her, providing they did so only on the island of Zanzibar. Or once they returned to the island, for Anne Hunter to put Ryan on the auction block. Would the woman do something like that? He scrubbed one hand down his face, then shook his head. No. Anne Hunter was much too concerned with her own reputation to sully it with such actions. But any of the natives? Trent clenched his teeth. A woman as beautiful as Ryan would fetch an exceptional sum that might be enough to entice even the most upright of souls into betrayal. Ryan stirred restlessly, then he laid a hand against her head. Shh, Ryan. I'm here. Just rest. His touch seemed to calm her and she settled into sleep once more. Trent wrapped one of her curls around his finger and stroked it with his thumb. Four months ago, he would have scoffed at anyone who told him he would come to care for the girl, and now all he could think about was that he must do everything in his power to protect her. He would get her back to Stonetown as soon as possible. But for now, he needed to get her father's body ready for burial. He rose quietly, so as not to disturb her. One Kulu had been escorted from the village at the point of several spears and sent along his way with a firm invective never to return. Now he stood by the side of the path, hands clasped behind his head, and watched the path that had remained empty since the headman had returned to the village. He pivoted and scanned the path in the direction of what had once been his own prosperous village, before the Azungu had come along and encouraged the rebellion of all his subjects, including his wife. He needed to think. A large baobab grew to the side of the path, casting a long patch of shade, and he strode to it and squatted to his haunches to think. He was still sitting thus when two men on their way out for a hunt stopped by to give him the news. The Azungu doctor was dead, and it had come to be known that the Azungu woman carried some blood of the people in her veins. Because of this, her father was being given the highest honor of burial in the graveyard of the chiefs. Wankulu grunted his acknowledgement of the news, but as the two men walked away, he plucked a blade of grass and tucked it between his teeth, a gleam of satisfaction in his eyes. So, the Azungu woman who had run him out of his hut at the point of a gun wasn't so Azungu after all, and it was obvious this woman was of great interest to the Azungu captain who had encouraged both Juan Kulu's wife and his people to abandon him. He was also friends with Keiko, son of the great chief, and the one who had planted the seeds of the rebellion in the hearts of Juan Kulu's people. And what hurt the Azungu captain was sure to hurt Keiko. Thus the answer to Juan Kulu's problems had been handed to him as though already dangling from the end of a spear. Now he knew exactly how to repay them, and he wouldn't even be required to expend himself to do it. Rising, he strode from the shade and started out at a trot on a path, leading toward the place where the sun lifted into the sky each morning. Ryan clutched her violin case to herself and watched numbly as the four men lifted the stretcher that carried Papa's enshrouded body. Trent stepped up to her side. Concern etched his features. Ready. She nodded but the truth was she would never be ready for this moment. Trent motioned the men to proceed. They made their way through the village, 
and from every direction people stepped out to join the procession. A woman about halfway back down the line once more broke into a loud luluing yowl that sent a jolt through Ryan, the first piercing cry. Soon women all along the procession picked up the wail. Even though the loud sound of their traditional keening was a sign of respect for Papa, it was almost more than Ryan's nerves could take. Only the captain's steady hand at her back kept her from screaming for them all to be silent. Her feet felt made of lead, and her heart also, as they strode past the last huts at the edge of the village and headed down the path to the thornbush-fenced graveyard of the chiefs. To prevent animals from sneaking in later and disturbing the graves, the gate in the thorny wall was opened and then closed as soon as the procession had passed through. When they arrived at the gravesite, Ryan once again nearly came to her undoing as she stared at the hole in the ground. All around her, everything seemed blurry. The keening, the colours, the people. Everything but the hole dug into the sandy taupe earth. The hole that was so deep, only shadow delineated the bottom. The hole that would soon hold the body of her dear, dear papa. The wind picked up and whipped a strand of hair across her face. And with relief... She closed her eyes. The captain had volunteered to say a few words, and she was ever so grateful because she didn't think she could have found her voice with a task left up to her. Holding Papa's Bible, the captain stepped to the front, and slowly the wailing died off as the people prepared to listen. As the silence descended, Ryan felt the release of some of her tension. She pulled in a calming breath, brushed her hair from her face and turned her gaze to the swaying fawns of the palm tree overhead. She didn't want her last glimpse of Papa to be one of him being lowered into the ground. But she couldn't block out the sounds of scuffing and the swish and soft thud as Papa's body slid from the stretcher into his grave. She blinked hard to hold the tears at bay, knowing that if she let them start, she would have a hard time putting a stop to them again. Finally, the forebearers stepped back and Ryan allowed her focus to descend from the treetops. With Keiko by his side, as translator, the captain spoke. For the past weeks, the doctor has talked to you in his chapel of a god who wants only the best for you. He paused, waiting for Keiko to translate. That same god has a place of peace for us to go when we die. The good doctor is there even now, because the Bible, God's word, assures us that to be absent from the body is to be present with our Lord. The doctor feels no more pain, will never again experience sickness or death or tears. A murmur traversed the villagers at this apparently odd teaching, but the captain didn't seem phased. He opened Papa's Bible, and as he began to read, Ryan recognized the passage from the 21st chapter of Revelation, describing heaven. And with each new verse about the lack of pain and sorrow, the peace and the beauty of this place, Ryan found herself imagining Papa there, even now, perhaps receiving the grand tour from Jesus himself. And as much as she was going to miss him, she couldn't begrudge him the joy he must be feeling. The captain concluded his short talk and nodded to her. She had requested to play her violin for her Papa one last time. But now as her fingers trembled against the latches of the case, she wondered if she would even be able to draw out the first note. Her gaze skittered to the hole, and then to the captain. There was a world of understanding in his eyes. He tilted his head as though asking if she wanted him to continue without her song. No, she would do this for Papa. With firm resolve, she snapped open the latches and smoothed back the velvet cover. The wood was like hardened silk beneath her fingers as she lifted the instrument out. She tightened the bow and tucked the chin rest close, shutting her eyes at the familiar feel of it. A sob was almost her undoing, but she clamped it off, sniffed, and pulled in a fortifying breath. For Papa, one last time. She played his favorite hymn. When I survey the wondrous cross, she repeated the tune four times and sang each verse silently in her mind. When I survey the wondrous cross on which the Prince of Glory died, my richest gain I count but loss and pour contempt on all my pride. 
Forbid it, Lord, that I should boast, save in the death of Christ my God. All the vain things that charm me most, I sacrifice them to his blood. See from his head, his hands, his feet, sorrow and love flow mingled down. Did e'er such love and sorrow meet, or thorns compose so rich a crown? Were the whole realm of nature mine, that were a present far too small, love so amazing, so divine, demands my soul, my life, my all. And Papa had given his all. She pulled in a breath, and this time she played straight from her heart, releasing the cry of anguish that had been building slowly there since she'd first figured out that Papa would not be recovering from what they thought a chill. She let all her sorrow whisper through her bow, and then she let it speak, and then she let it shout, building to a crescendo that had her closing her eyes. Do you hear me, Lord? What now? Softly, once again she played her prayer. And this time she wanted to look at the people her papa had given everything for. She turned her body slightly so she could study the villagers as they listened. These were her people. Was she related to any of them? After papa had told her about her grandmother being from this village, she hadn't even thought beyond that. But now, the notes from her violin lifted on the breeze and melded with the soft song of the palm branches. All along this journey she had thought that the moment Papa passed, she would head back home to Zanzibar. But perhaps God had prepared the way for her to come here for just this moment, to continue Papa's ministry after he was gone. The gentle wind kissed her face, bringing with it the sweet scent of the waters of the lake. She closed her eyes once more, but this time, this time the notes of the song transformed from minor to major as a little of her despair lifted. A brighter tune flowed as a fraction of her sorrow drifted away. Mother and Jasmine didn't need her. Rory certainly didn't need her. But these people, yes, these people needed her. This was her call. Here God could use her. And hopefully, as she stepped in to fill the need, her response, her choice, would bring blessing and prevent some measure of evil from befalling these people. Use me, Father, as you wish to lessen the pain in this sin-sick world, and help me to hear your directing voice. With a sigh, she drew out the final note, long and slow, and then dropped the violin to her side. A murmur of appreciative awe swept over those gathered. This was the first time any of them had heard her play, and Ryan determined it would not be the last. Hadn't the captain said as much just the other day? We must take up our crosses, give our fleshly desires over to God so he can show us what he wants of us, just like he did for your father. Let us defend the fatherless and work for the oppressed as willing tools in his arsenal. Ryan nodded to the captain that she was done as she tucked the violin back into its case. Captain Dawson closed Papa's Bible and lifted it in one hand for the people to see. The same God who gives us these promises can be spoken to just as you and I speak with each other on a daily basis. Keiko repeated the words to the people, and then the captain continued. Let us speak to him now. Captain Dawson bowed his head and committed Papa's spirit into the Lord's hands. Afterward, he stepped over to her side. Ryan reached out and squeezed his arm, offering a weary smile. Thank you, Captain. Your reminder about heaven was a great comfort to me. Behind them, two men set to filling the grave, and each thud of dirt felt like the impact of a fist against Ryan's chest. She closed her eyes, once more willing herself to keep a rein on her emotions. The captain pressed his hand against her back. I'm sorry. Let us return to the village. She nodded and stepped out ahead of him. The captain tucked his hands behind himself as he strolled beside her. The second song you played. It was beautiful, but I didn't recognize it. What was it? Ryan brushed a lock of hair from her eyes. It was mine. The captain looked over at her. Truly? She nodded. Sometimes a tune has just been building inside me, and I have to let it out. Do you ever mark them down? Ryan shrugged. 
I'm no composer, Captain. They had arrived at her hut, and they paused outside the door. The song you just played belies your words. You have a wonderful talent, as I've told you in the past. You should mark the songs down. Ryan had no rejoinder for that, so she merely looked down at her clasped hands. The captain's feet shuffled. We've plans to discuss, but I can see you are weary. Rest for a while, and I'll return this evening. Ryan was weary, but there was no need for the captain to make any plans. She set her violin case inside the door and spoke to him over her shoulder. I've decided to stay. He actually jolted, then folded his arms over his chest, his white shirt billowing in the breeze. You've what? Challenge radiated from his every pore. You said it yourself. We must take up our crosses and serve as the Lord asks us to. Yes, I said it, but things have changed. He kicked at a stone, then looked out toward the waves cresting onto the shore. Ryan felt something go still inside her. What has changed? The captain's jaw bunched. You were only here for your father, not for the Lord. Don't mistake duty for calling. Ryan tilted her head and studied the village huts she could see spread along the perimeter of the lake. Perhaps, she waved a hand. I've no will to argue at the moment. Can we talk about this another time? His lips thinned. Rest for now, but yes, we will speak of this again. She ought to tell him her decision was made, and there would be no profit for him in further discussion. But her capacity for keeping her composure was just about expired. She needed some privacy. She retreated into her hut. Thank you, Captain. And with that she closed the door, strode across the room, and collapsed onto her cot. She gave in to the wave of grief pulsing over her, and great sobs shook her. Part Four Juan Kulu found the men he'd been searching for, just as the sun rose above the mountains to the east. He had run from one village to the next all day and all night, but now he would tell his tale and then he would sleep most peacefully, knowing his enemies would be repaid for their wrongs against him. The slavers were just rising, and the Arab squatted near the fire, holding his hands to the flames as a pot steamed in the fire centre. Juan Kulu approached the edge of the light, dropped to one knee, bowed his head, and clapped his hands. The deference grated, but it would hopefully gain him favour. To his right he could hear the clang of metallic links tinking together. The sound sent a jolt of trepidation through him. Perhaps this hadn't been the wisest move on his part. It was rather like marching up to the outskirts of a pride of lions and then announcing himself. Perhaps he should retreat and rethink his intended revenge. But before he had time to move, the call for him to enter the circle of light rang out. Loani! To retreat now that he had been acknowledged would have the lions chasing him down. So pressing down his panic, he stood scooted forward a few steps, and then lowered himself to one knee again. If he played this right, perhaps the spirits would ensure that he didn't end up chained to the line of slaves. Speak, one of the traders prodded. What is your purpose? Wankulu kept his face turned toward the ground. It is my understanding that you are not only searching for strong, healthy slaves, but for beautiful women also. A quick glance showed the Arab appeared more interested in picking at his teeth with a stem of grass than in Wankulu's news. He felt a bead of sweat slip between his shoulder blades. Finally, the trader responded. What of it? I know of a village that is very prosperous. That chief works his people hard, so their gardens grow lush, and they are a vigorous and strong people. There are many such villages all along the way. The disinterest in the man's tone was leaning toward irritation now. Monkulu willed away his trembling. Yes, this is true. But in this village, there is a woman of great beauty. One who would fetch three, maybe four times the amount that any of those might fetch you. He tipped a nod toward the sound of the chains. The Arab lowered the grass stem, tilted his head. Tell me more. Monkulu licked his lips and pressed down his excitement. First, let us speak of my price. Far to the north, a coastal town, along the Gulf of Aden, lay baking in the sun. A ship flying the flag of England, 
but most freshly from trading their goods in Oman, pulled into the harbour. But no Steve Dor strode out to meet her. The captain docked the ship, and for a long moment he and his crew stood in the breeze on the deck, staring at the seemingly abandoned docks. A gull whined far above them, answered by another. Waves sloshed against the underside of the dock in a constant rhythm, and off to the right a mongrel sat on its haunches, eyeing them. But not a soul stirred. The captain tested the scent of the wind. Fetid fish, briny water, moss, mould, dust, all scents common to a wharf, but missing with a sense of alehouse meals and wood smoke. After a moment one sailor covered himself with the sign of the cross. "'Tis an omen cup. Ought to be moving. as the next town we should." The captain was never one to go in for superstition, however, and he brushed away his crewman's concerns. "'We've need a water, Jonesy.' He snapped his fingers at his first mate. "'Send a crew ashore to see what's about. Look sharp.' The market square, which should have been filled with the bustle of activity, lay silent as a grave. Only the scuttle of a leaf scooting along the cobbles created any sound. One of the sailors bumped into the first mate from behind. Gives me an eerie feeling, this does, sir. Let us water up right fast, so to be on our way. I concur. The first mate shuddered and motioned back toward the ship. Bring the buckets. The city well lay in the market square close to the harbour side, and while several men dashed back to the ship to fetch buckets, two others set to drawing up the first fresh water from the depths. Never had the brigade worked so quickly or so smoothly with each other. To a man, they were all eager to be shut of the place. Above them, a buzzard loosed a loud cry that set several of the men to crossing themselves, and the buckets moved down the line even faster after that. By the time they left the town, still not a saw had come into sight. But the wind was strong and filled their sails like the overfilled cheeks of a hungry babe. They sailed for fifteen minutes in utter silence. And then Charles Cottrell, the newest member of the crew, socked the man next to him in the arm. The two men looked at one another and burst out laughing as relief at being away from the place set in. Soon the men all along the deck were laughing and joking and jabbing one another, comfortable and relieved now that they were away from the place and back into the familiar vastness of the sea. With nothing having gone wrong, they settled into their routines. Charles Cottrell died two days later. Jasmine Hunter was still laughing at the antics of one of her students as she pulled on her gloves and stepped from the small cottage they were using for a schoolhouse. Garrett Holloman, dressed in tight black breeches and a free-flowing white shirt, was leaning, arms folded, against the nutmeg tree at the edge of the schoolyard. Jasmine halted, gave her gloves an irritated tug, and then strode toward him. I told you I didn't need you to walk me home. He straightened languidly and leaned into his heels. And I told you? I would be here. You may walk several paces ahead of me if you don't like the idea of being seen with me. She sniffed. It has nothing to do with not wanting to be seen with you. She spun and started down the road at a fast clip. Maybe he would get the message and leave her be, for her heart was certainly taking a beating each time he came around, and she didn't know if it would last the month if he insisted on showing up every day to walk her home from classes. Doesn't it? His brows lifted, and he fell into step beside her. Well, hope lifts all ships. Jasmine spun toward him. What does that mean? Garrett battered away her question, and then lifted his hand to work the muscles in his neck. Nothing. Forget I said anything. You may be a man who can easily forget things that are said, but I assure you, I am not of that ilk. Jasmine took a calming breath, her cheeks heating over the fury coating the words she just flung at him and before he could take note of it, she spun away and resumed her smart march toward town. He wasn't far behind. And now it is my turn to ask what you mean, Miss Hunter. Nothing. Forget I said anything. She tossed his own words back in his face, aggravated that he seemed to be casually strolling and yet still kept pace with her. So, it appears we are at yet another impasse. Shocking, I must say. The sarcasm dripping from his words could have drowned an army. She spun toward him and stopped, no matter that they were right in the middle of the road. We would never have needed to be at any impasse if your word meant something to you. She would not cry. She wouldn't. 
She started to spin away from him again, but this time his hand shot out and gripped her arm. He stepped closer and leaned in. My word means everything to me, Miss Hunter. And if you are suggesting I lied to you about something, I certainly would like to know to what you are referring. Anger glinted in the depths of his blue eyes. Jasmine sniffed and lifted her chin, blinking hard, but refusing to look away. Problem was, she couldn't very well say anything without revealing too much of her heart, and she would rather die than let this pompous, arrogant knave know he had hurt her. It was nothing. His hand tightened on her arm, and he tilted her a look. Jazz, don't call me that. You have no right. Don't I? He stepped closer, his countenance softening. I thought the time we spent together meant as much to you as it did to me. And then you left without so much as a fathy well. The words were out before she could rethink them. It was his confounded eyes. She couldn't look into that velvety blue without falling headlong into honesty. Without so much as a fair? He stepped back and lowered his chin, folding his arms. So the silver tea service I sent over. The one that I paid a good bit of coin to have your name in a cluster of jasmine flowers engraved on, that counted for nothing, and the letter that accompanied it, asking you to wait? Oh, dash it. He swiped a hand through the air as though wishing he could erase this entire conversation and started off toward town. Never mind. But Jasmine wasn't going to let him off so easy. Whatever was he talking about? I have no idea what you mean but I can assure you that I never received such a gift from you, nor a letter. He paused and spun toward her. Come again. Jasmine felt the hard and stony places inside her turn soft, like Mama's sponge cake, sopped in strawberry juice. Could the man really have sent such a gift to her? And what had he said in the letter? Asked her to wait? Wait for what? Her heart rate picked up at just the thought of the answer. It could have changed everything she'd been feeling for the past month if it was true. Could change everything now. Her mouth went dry. She lifted her skirts and stepped past him. I think this conversation has run its course, Mr. Holloman. Let's just head into town, if you please. The irritating man muttered something as he strode out after her. She couldn't quite make it out. But it sounded like he said, Oh, I'll head into town. And that's for certain. Two weeks later, Trent intercepted June as she was bringing some dinner to Ryan at her hut. On every occasion that he'd set himself to the task of convincing Ryan it was time to return home, his conscience had pricked him to give her a few more days to grieve. But now the task could be delayed no longer. Reports of unrest in the surrounding villages were growing. Runners came daily to report another village had been sacked. Either a new slave trader was making his way through the area, or Khalifa had reversed his course and was backtracking. And no matter what it was, it didn't bode well for Ryan. So despite her protests, for the past two weeks, Trent had bedded down outside her hut, and he'd gotten little sleep. He'd seen too many greedy looks cast upon Ryan to let his guard down. It would take only a moment of inattention on his part, and Ryan could fall to the mercy of some villager bent on profit alone. She was far too trusting of everyone, just as she had been back home on the island. Despite her grieving, she'd continued to open the clinic each morning and had run the services at the chapel each afternoon. And yesterday, he'd nearly been in a panic when he'd stepped away from the clinic for two minutes and returned to find her gone. His relief when he found her tending to the newest village baby had nearly taken the strength from his knees. And then last night, as he'd lain with his hands clasped behind his head, Studying the stars above, it had hit him. During their long months of travel, he had been careful to keep his growing estimation of Ryan hidden for her protection. But now, since she'd made the news of her heritage known, his publicly state claim on her might be the only protection she would have. Holding the bowl of victuals in one hand and the cup of tea in the other, he studied the door of her hut with some trepidation. Why did he have a feeling she wasn't going to take the news at all well? Swallowing away his concern, he knocked on the flimsy wood door with the toe of one boot. Come, she called. He entered and then froze. She obviously hadn't been expecting him. Though she was fully clothed, she sat cross-legged on her mat, with her hair tumbled about her and a hairbrush in one hand. Captain, 
she scrambled to her feet, rapidly gathering her mass of ebony curls at the back of her neck. I thought you would be June. Trent swallowed and strode purposefully to the small table on the other side of the room. He hadn't been in here since her father's passing. He'd expected that she would have rolled up her father's mat and gathered his things into his trunk. But every item lay almost exactly as it had the last time he'd been in here. Trent rested his fingers against the table and kept his back to her, giving her time to put herself together. The vision of her hair cascading all about her slender shoulders returned to him when he closed his eyes against it. After a moment she spoke. What can I do for you, Captain? Taking that as permission, he turned to face her. She stood quietly, hands folded before her. No fancy silks or lace and with nothing but a mud wall behind her. And she was still the most beautiful woman he'd ever seen. His first instinct was to blurt out that she should marry him. But that wouldn't do at all. He bit one side of his lip. Blast this infernal wasteland with no priest or pastor for hundreds of miles. He must think his next words through carefully, or she would laugh him right out the door. And rightly so. He folded his arms. Perhaps he could quietly stake his claim on her among the villagers, without even having to bring her in on the plan? Yes, that might keep her safe in the short term, but his main goal needed to be in taking her back to Zanzibar. Before your father passed, he asked that I do all in my power to protect you after he was gone. At the mention of her father, she blinked several times and smoothed her hands over her skirts. Yes, I know that and I thank you. Since your father seemed to trust me, I would ask that you also trust my judgment and heed my counsel. She tilted him a look, one eyebrow cocked and her lips twisted in a way that made it plain she was admonishing him to return to reality. But he wouldn't be dissuaded. Ryan, you must go back to Zanzibar. She stiffened and lifted her chin stubbornly. He reassessed. The words had come out more forcefully than he intended. To soften their impact, he added, Your family will be worried about you once they hear of your father's passing. She brushed the thought away with a swipe of one hand. I will write to them, so they know of my well-being. My place is here, Captain. If you yourself want to return to the island, I release you from any perceived commitment to my safety, and I thank you for your concern. Perceived commitment? Trent snapped his teeth together before his surge of frustration got the better of him. You've no need to thank me. Nevertheless, I do, Captain, and I've quite made up my mind, so... She let the rest of the thought trail away, as though the matter was settled. Perhaps a reminder of what she'd so stubbornly wanted only weeks ago was in order. Think back to the time we spent on Commodore Llewellyn's estate. You would have done just about anything to return to Zanzibar then. She sighed and pressed her palms together. Yes, but that was before a sweep of her hand encompassed the village. I met these people, before I knew they were my people, and recognized how much I could do to help them. You yourself said just the other day that perhaps much of the evil in the world happens because people don't heed God's call to step in. My family will be fine without me, Captain. But here, they need me. You are the most stubborn woman on the face of the earth. The words burst forth before he could lay hold of them. Her gaze flew to his, her mouth falling open slightly. He scraped one hand through his hair and gripped the back of his neck. I'm sorry. I shouldn't have spoken so harshly. I just feel the burden for your safety quite heavily. He worked his teeth over his lip. Perhaps the best thing was to tell her his feelings outright. He softened his tone. My commitment is not out of duty to your father's request. Even had he asked me to leave you to your own devices after his passing, yet I would be here still. He held her focus steadily, willing her to see the true meaning of the word shining in his eyes. She licked her lips. Captain, perhaps you have not heard. I've wanted to tell you many times, but couldn't quite decide how to approach the subject. When her voice trailed away, he decided to make it easy on her. Keiko has informed me that your birth mother was a slave. She squinted at him, as though trying to assess how he felt about the information. You know, and still you are here? He frowned. 
Why would I not be here? It's just that most men would have... She pivoted partially away from him, rolled her lips in and pressed them together, then paced to the door he'd left open upon his entry and stared out toward the lake. Only a couple months passed. You inform me not could grow between us, Captain. There was a beat, and then she continued. I have resigned myself to this reality. The words were like a spear thrust to his heart, yet the hand she laid against the doorpost at her shoulder trembled, and that gave him hope. All that has changed now, where once my veneration of you might have brought you danger. Now that you have made your heritage known, a relationship with me might be your only safety. Her hand on the doorpost clenched into a fist. I see. So, tis only for my safety that you... She tossed him a glance, then folded her arms. I knew full well the danger I might be placing myself in when I disclosed my secret, Captain and I'll not have you sacrifice all you hold dear, simply because you are concerned for my well-being. Whatever was she talking about? A few swift strides placed him at her side, where he took her hand and turned her to face him. Apparently, I have not made it clear enough that all I hold most dear in the world stands directly before me. He raised one hand to touch her chin and heard her take in a small breath. Trent. Please don't toy with me. He felt one side of his mouth lift on the tug of a smile, for she'd said his name on her own without him having to beg her for it. Her chin was soft under the caress of his knuckle. Always I have endeavoured to honesty. Yet now you would accuse me of toying, little lioness. Back along the trail, I got the impression you were courting a woman. In the Americas, perhaps? What about her? Trent didn't even try to prevent the bark of laughter that burst forth. Courting a woman? In the Americas? Whatever gave you such an idea? Her lips turned petulant. When you said you couldn't see me, I presume there was another. He drew her hand against his chest. My reasons for not seeing you were to keep you far from danger, as stated. But trust me when I say that on many an occasion my heart has protested the requirement for distance I laid upon myself. She still didn't look convinced. There is not, nor has there ever been, another woman in my life, save my mother, God rest her. He tucked a wayward strand of her hair back into place. Ryan tilted her head. Do you only woo me in an attempt to gain my capitulation to return to Zanzibar? He shook his head. Never. Her lips quirked. The first inclination that he might have been ensnared in a trap zipped through him. Good then, for I am quite determined to stay. As she giggled, he growled. If that pleading look you are casting my way elicited in your father anywhere near the same desire to satisfy you as it does in me, it is no wonder the man constantly let you have your way. A gentle blush touched her cheeks, and she fanned herself with one hand. Will you walk with me? Along the shore, I have a sudden desire for some fresh air. Trent's sudden desire had more to do with bumping the door closed and kissing her until they were both out of breath. But for now he contented himself with tucking her hand against his arm and leading her out into the evening breeze. From a fishing canoe out upon the lake, Khalifa peered through his field glasses toward the hut at one end of the village where Wankulu had assured him this woman of most unusual beauty lived. Beside him, Wankulu prodded for the hundredth time. Can you see her yet? Khalifa lowered the glasses to glower at the man. Stop pestering. I will let you know if I see anything. Before resuming his scrutiny, he rolled his neck first to one side and then to the other this weight with the heat of the sun beating down on him and the sweat dripping out from beneath his kufia was beginning to wear on him. Wankulu couldn't be setting him up in some way with false information, could he? It was not the first time he'd had the thought, and for that reason he'd brought an extra guard with him in the canoe. But he suddenly realized that Wankulu could have bribed the man, for which native ever had been faithful and trustworthy. He eyed his guard carefully. The man sat, arms folded and stoic, at the back of the canoe. 
Deciding he was being paranoid, Khalifa lifted the glasses back to his eyes, just in time to see a flash of motion near the door of the hut. Someone had entered the abode, and he'd missed seeing who it was. The door was left open now, but the interior was too dark for him to make anything out. With frustration, he lowered the glasses again and swiped at a trickle of sweat slipping down the back of his neck. Honkulu had been able to tell him very little about the woman other than that she was fair-skinned and had recently arrived at the village. But he'd been most adamant that she would fetch a soaring price on an auction block. Perhaps the woman was descended from one of the tribes far to the north. Many of them were quite light-skinned. He caught a flicker of movement and lifted the glasses. Someone was in the doorway, but standing just far enough back to remain mostly hidden in shadow. Blast this heat! He scooped his kofia into the lake and dumped a measure of the cool water over his head, shaking away the drippings from his eyes. He would be dry within moments and likely be hot again, but for now the coolness brought great relief. Onkulu finally settled into silence, and for several moments the only sounds were the cries of the fish eagles diving for their dinners, the occasional splash from a blue trout leaping at some unlucky bug, and the chattering from the troop of monkeys in the palm trees along the shore. On the beach to the north, a hippo and her calf emerged from the lake to snort through the long grasses at the back of the sand, and then more movement caught Khalifa's eye. He swung the glasses back to focus on the hut, his eyes widened, and he cursed all the crazy gods who had made him believe Monkulu's foolish story. In an instant, he dropped the binoculars into his bag on the bottom of the canoe and leaped over to take Wonkulu by the throat. The man's eyes bulged as he clutched at Khalifa's wrist and tried vainly to take in air. Khalifa glanced over at his guard. The man must be faithful after all, for he remained in his stoic pose, simply watching the two of them. Khalifa returned his focus to Wonkulu. You fool! That woman is whiter than your teeth. Her father is a doctor, an indigo plantation owner on the island of Zanzibar, and her mother is as blonde as a Dane. Wankulu shook his head pitifully and tried to speak, but Khalifa was having none of it. He had sat baking in the sun for an entire afternoon, and he'd returned miles along the trail. He could have been days farther along the way toward the coast and a comfortable bed, but instead he'd agreed to check out the rumor, only to find this. Ryan Hunter, a black woman? The man was mad. And that had been Dawson at her side. Khalifa had no desire to go up against one such as that. One Kulu's feet scrabbled feebly across the bottom of the canoe now, but Khalifa squeezed all the harder. The man had drawn his last breath on this side of the abyss. It was only a moment more before the man's body went limp, and Khalifa motioned for the guard to help him. Together they heaved the man over the side of the canoe, he would be crocodile fodder inside of ten minutes. Khalifa adjusted his kanzu and sank back onto his seat. Thankfully, Wankulu had not soiled it. Return us to the shore, he ordered. Without a word, the guard set the oar into the water and started them forward. But after several strokes, he lifted his gaze to Khalifa and jutted his chin toward the village. This woman's father died not long ago. There is a rumor among the people, that her mother was a slave, descended from this region. Khalifa blinked. He turned his gaze first toward the shore, where he'd last seen the tiny dots of Miss Hunter and Captain Dawson walking along the beach, then back to the place where Wonkulu's body had disappeared below the blue waters of the lake. Perhaps the poor fool had been right after all. At least it appeared the story ought to be checked out. For if it were true, Miss Hunter would indeed fetch an astonishing price on the Chinese market. And wouldn't that be sweet revenge for the way she'd spurned him all those months ago in the Harcourt's garden? Khalifa scooped another capful of water over his head. A smile split his face. The good doctor might not have been so good, after all. I. Ryan could hardly believe the giddy emotions swirling through her. With her hand tucked into the crook of Trent's arm, she tilted her face to catch a bit more of the breeze off the lake. He had no other woman in the Americas. His actions had been for her benefit all along. And now, just when she'd resigned herself to losing him forever, he'd made it clear his interest in her went far beyond simply keeping her safe and returning her to Zanzibar. 
How far did his intentions go, however? For unlike Braden, who had asked her to marry him at every opportunity since they were children, the captain had made no such request or even a close proclamation. She angled her gaze toward the man. Today he seemed more relaxed than he had been in the past several weeks. The breeze caught at his hair as he looked over the cerulean waters. She followed his gaze. Far out on the lake, a canoe of fishermen sketched an almost imperceptible outline against the horizon. Her gaze returned to the captain's face. Did he have marriage in mind? Her face heated at the mere thought. He glanced at her. You are getting overheated in the sun. We should return you to your hut. When he tried to turn them back, she tightened her grip on his arm. No, I'm fine, really. Let's keep walking a little farther. Maybe she could tease a few more of his intentions from him while they walked. I know you want me to return to Zanzibar. However, I can't help but honestly feel this is the place where I can offer the most help at the moment. Perhaps it was the Lord who orchestrated to bring us both here. He inhaled slowly, then pulled her to a stop and turned her to look at him. There's no easy way to say this, so I'm just going to come out with it. You do realize that since it is now known your mother was a slave, and you carry native blood, any one of these people might betray you, and you could be taken captive. His throat worked, and concern etched his features. One drop, that's all it takes. One drop of native blood, and you are considered free game on the markets. Tis madness, I know, but I fear for you, nonetheless. Yes, she did know that had considered it more than once since she told June and Yanja the truth, had even worried over it a time or two, but she'd always felt it was such a remote possibility. She squeezed Trent's arm and started them walking again. I admit that I've considered that danger, but I don't think any of them would do that. I'm here to help them, she tilted him a look. Besides that, even were I to return to Zanzibar, what would stop someone there from doing the same? Your parents were wise to keep your lineage a secret, if only for your safety. But there are other ways to ensure your safety. Ryan clenched her teeth. Still, the man didn't outright mention marriage. Trent seemed to misjudge the reason for her agitation. He covered her hand where it rested against his arm. I know it shouldn't have to be that way. In a perfect world, it wouldn't be that way. But since we don't live in a perfect world, it was best. She sighed. Perhaps. You've taught June so much. She's helped you constantly in the clinic. We can leave her your father's medicines and know that the people here are in good hands. Ryan stopped beneath a palm tree and lifted her face to study the branches. How does one determine the will of the Lord for their life, do you think? Trent rubbed the back of his neck with one hand. I suppose there's no pat answer. God probably speaks to each person with as much individuality as he used in creating them. So then, how am I to know what is from the Lord? What if he used Papa's sickness and my concern for him to bring me here to help these people, to witness to them in a way that no one else likely can? She turned to survey the village, which now lay far behind them on the beach. But then, she waved her hand. These questions were so complicated she wasn't even sure how to voice them. Trent stepped in front of her and cupped her cheek. But then what if he is speaking through my urgings for you to return to Zanzibar? Is that it? Yes, exactly. When he said it like that, it made the quandary seem rather simple. His lips curled up at the corners. I can tell you which one I think is right. She couldn't help but smile in return, though she dipped her chin and gave him a be serious look. Expression turning somber, he stepped closer to her. His gaze roamed leisurely over her face, from her hairline to her lips, where it paused. He swallowed an inch nearer. Often you ask me questions that test the bounds of my theology, Ryan. I know not the answers. I believe God can speak audibly. I believe he can speak through dreams. I believe he can speak to us in many ways. And I think that as long as we are looking to him with hearts that long to do his will, we need not fear whether we are doing it or not. Perhaps God leads us by our desires in some cases, first by your desire that your father not be alone at his passing, and now by your desire to help these people 
who are connected to you in ways you never knew before. So he slipped one hand behind her back and tugged her toward him until they stood pressed together. If this is where you feel the Lord is calling you, I will endeavor to trust the Lord in that and will labor here by your side. Only first, return to Zanzibar with me so we can be married. Sardonic humor twisted her lips. Was that a proposal, Captain? His grin bloomed full. It was rather a bad one, wasn't it? She lifted an eyebrow and touched his chin with one finger. I've had better. From that whelp of a pup Harcourt, no doubt, he growled. She tipped her head back on a giggle, but when she returned her face to the fore, Trent had brought his so near, she stopped short. Perhaps a proper proposal should begin with a kiss. What say you, Ryan? She angled her head, pretending deep thought but her heart was racing so that she felt sure he could hear it. I believe you may be right, Captain Dawson. He leaned forward until his lips hovered just above hers, grousing quietly. What happened to Trent? She capitulated without protest, suddenly wanting more than anything for him to cease delaying. I believe you may be right, Trent. His mouth tilted into a satisfied smile. And then he kissed her, and she feared she may have moaned softly at the bliss of it. His kiss was gentle and sure, smooth and commanding, full of ardor and yet full of restraint. His hand at her waist, he tugged her closer, and footsteps crunched across the sand behind him. Footsteps, she jolted back to peer behind Trent. Trent must have heard the telltale sound too, for he spun around, clutching her to his back in a protective gesture. Over Trent's shoulder, she saw a native man with a knife in one hand, nearly upon them. Trent! Trent swiped the man's arm to one side and threw his knee into the man's groin. The native doubled over with a cry. Ryan, run! Back to the village! Trent never took his eyes off their attacker, who was slowly getting to his feet. Ryan's boots felt mortared into the sand. The native lunged at Trent again, and again Trent slapped his arm to one side. This time, Trent slammed the man's wrist down against his knee, and the knife flew off into the long, swaying grasses growing close by. Trent swung hard, and his fist connected with the man's jaw. Spittle caught the last rays of the sun as it flew in an arc from the man's mouth. Their attacker fell to the sand, and Trent was instantly upon him, his knee pressed firmly against the man's chest. Trent's shoulders moved rapidly as he fought for breath. Seeing that Trent had the upper hand with the man loosed Ryan's feet from their roots, she turned to flee toward the village and ran straight into a solid wall of flesh. Khalifa wrapped bony hands firmly around her arms. You! Ryan tried to jerk away. But Khalifa was strong and able to hold her without struggle. Oh yes, it's me, the man grinned, his two long teeth yellow beneath the hooked beak of his nose. Let her go, she heard Trent scrambling across the sand behind her. Khalifa's expression hardened and he spun her around to wrap one arm across her neck. Something clicked next to her head, and she felt the cold press of steel against her temple. Not another step, Dawson. Trent skidded to a halt without even arguing. He lifted his hands, palms out, and all the starch seemed to slip out of him. Seeing that Trent was under control, the native scrambled across the sand and scrabbled through the tall grass where his knife had disappeared. I hear you have been keeping secrets, Miss Hunter. Khalifa ground the pistol a little harder against her temple, but said the words as if they might be having tea in a stone town parlor. Trent's shoulders slumped even farther at those words, but his eyes never left Khalifa. With a grunt of triumph, the native man held his recovered knife above his head. In a flash, he was back before Trent, a gleam of hatred in his eyes as he laid the tip of the blade against Trent's belly. Panic gave Ryan voice. No, please, Khalifa, tell him not to hurt the captain. I'll come with you. She couldn't disguise the pleading in her tone. She met Trent's gaze, feeling all the despair in the world drop onto her shoulders. When you walk through the waters, I will be there, and through the flames. God's word said it, but how deep did the waters have to get before he showed up? For the first few weeks after Papa's passing, she had felt like she might just shrivel up and die herself, but now... Facing the death of the man she loved raised pain from places in her heart she'd never felt before. 
Please, Khalifa, she pleaded. Khalifa said a few short words to the native, and the man reluctantly stepped back, but not before he let his blade cut a slow, deliberate slice across Trent's stomach. Trent hissed but held his ground. A deep red ooze seeped into his shirt from the cut, but Trent kept his hands raised. With a taunting smirk, the native melted into the tall grass at the back of the beach, and Khalifa started to pull Ryan in that direction also. Relief that they were going to let Trent live was all she could focus on at the moment. She willed him to see her love in her eyes. He tipped her a reassuring nod, as if to tell her to hang on, he would come for her. And then Khalifa stretched out his arm and shot Trent. Trent took a step back and glanced down at himself. Blood blossomed with a gush this time, and Trent clutched at the wound with both hands. For one suspended moment, Ryan felt frozen, and then she was screaming, No! No! Ryan threw an elbow into Khalifa's ribs, satisfied to hear his grunt of pain. No! She must reach Trent. She scratched and clawed and kicked, determined to escape and go help him. But Khalifa's arm could not be budged. He dragged her backward despite her best efforts. Trent's knees collapsed, and he glanced down at his chest as he dropped to the sand. And then the grasses sprang back into place and blocked her view of him. Ryan's heart despaired, and she gave up the futile fight. So all her questions about God's will had come down to this. She was to forever be lonely, wretched, and heartbroken. And she would be sold as a slave to the highest bidding lecher, willing to put down money for her. Were some waters too deep for even God to penetrate? This has been A Walk Through the Waters, a serialized historical Christian romance. Sonnets of the Spice Isle, Book Four. Written by Lynette Bonner. Narrated by Mary Sarah Agliotta. Copyright 2016 by Lynette Bonner. Production copyright 2017 by Lynette Bonner. If you enjoyed this audio production of A Walk Through the Waters, Continue the story with Episode 5, The Trail of Chains, found on Amazon, Audible, and iTunes.